Hello, this is Christine Linke, Webcast Manager at Premia, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this Premia webinar. Today, Dr. Daryl Duffy will present Market Making Under the Proposed Volcker Rule. Dr. Duffy is the Dean Witter Distinguished Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University and is a distinguished author of finance books, the most recent being Dark Markets Measuring Corporate Default Risk, How Big Banks Fail, and What to Do About It. So now, Dr. Duffy, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Christine, and uh, welcome, everyone. I'm sitting here in my office at Stanford University, and I'm very pleased to be able to um, uh, do this webinar, thanks to, in part and in large measure to Premia. Um, as uh, Christine just mentioned, uh, I'm going to be addressing the implications of the proposed Volcker Rule uh, for um, U.S. financial markets and for financial stability more broadly. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, you should be aware, as indicated on the front page of my uh, slide package, um, of any potential conflicts of interest that you uh, that you may be interested in. You can find those on my webpage. Um, a, back, a bit of background to that is that I was asked to prepare a report by STIFMA, uh, the Securities Industry Financial Market Association, in connection with the Volcker Rule. Um, I declined the opportuni opportunity to do that as a consultant, but I I did do a report uh, that I submitted to them and to uh, the U.S. federal agencies that are responsible for implementing the Volcker Rule. As you know, most of you, the Volcker Rule is part of the Dodd-Frank Act, which is a statutory requirement um, for the regulators to enforce a no prop trading restriction on banks or bank affiliates uh, with some exemptions. And the exemption I'm focusing on today is the exemption to make markets. The other important exemption is the exemption to do underwriting, and those to some extent go together. What I'm going to do in the next uh, half an hour to 40 minutes or so is to walk everyone through how the rule is designed, um, that is how the agencies are proposing to enforce the Volcker rule in their ongoing rule writing process, and then to describe um, what I feel to be some potential adverse uh, consequences, unintended consequences, of the uh, proposed rule document that they've already circulated. Uh, this, is, um, this document is uh, um, first uh, provided by the SEC, uh, the FDIC, and the Federal Reserve uh, in a 290-page uh, document, and the CFTC has followed it with a similar uh, set of rules rules uh, proposing how they will implement um, the Volcker rule. Uh, this is not uh, these rules are not final yet. Uh, whether or not the rules are ready, the law uh, the Volcker rule uh, will, law will become in force in July of this year, um, and it's possible that the agencies will uh, consider some of the uh, uh, concerns that have been expressed in a, in. A, a large number of submissions that they have received uh, up until their comment deadline last week. The potential side effects um, that most concern me are a potential loss of market liquidity um, in, during a period of transition which could take uh, several years that is associated with a reduced appetite or willingness of um, bank or bank affiliate market makers to provide uh, robust market making services the second um, unintended consequence that I'm concerned about is that after uh, some time has passed, it's likely that other providers of market-making services will step into their place. Um, that will have a beneficial effect and that market liquidity may be restored to some extent or even completely. Uh, but uh, we would then have potentially large market makers that are not inside the regulated banking system, uh, which uh, leaves the potential for some concerns about financial stability. Uh, for example, um, if a large broker-dealer or other provider of um, market-making services were to uh, get into some difficulty, um, it would be operating in a different regulatory regime that would have different supervision, it would have uh, potentially different capital and liquidity requirements and may have less access to central bank liquidity than would be available 
uh, through a bank. That's a complicated issue, by the way. I don't mean to uh, um, to cut that issue short of, over um, the degree to which a bank can provide can can obtain liquidity from the Fed or market making services. It's it's not a simple matter. If you follow the the banking regulations, there are limits uh, on the ability of a bank to obtain liquidity for for purposes of market making from the Fed. Uh, because of these, uh, this sort of second stage effect, I do have concerns about systemic risk. It may turn out well, it may not turn out well. To, um, to put this in some context, uh, from the viewpoint of the agencies, they do have a statutory obligation, notwithstanding these concerns, to limit um, proprietary trading that's not market making, to rule it out. And they will have a task of, of uh, they'll have a difficult task in trying to implement that statute because um, I'll jump ahead two slides uh, because of the difficulty of distinguishing between market making uh, trading on the one hand and prop trading that's not designed to make markets on the other. So just to uh, give you a kind of conceptual uh, image of a market maker's inventory coming from uh, buying and selling uh, the slide that you currently looking at simply shows um, that a market maker may receive uh, requests to buy or to sell uh, substantial amounts of a given asset um, at uh, unpredictable times. And the purpose of a market maker is to provide immediacy to those requests. That is, when asked to buy, um, it will quote a price at which it's willing to buy. When asked to sell, it will quote a price at which it's willing to sell. And it will absorb those positions into its inventory. Uh, when it does that, its risk will go up or go down accordingly, and it will profit or not based on whether it made money or lost money uh, on those trades. Some of the trading profit will come from bid-ask spreads, and some of it will come from price appreciation after the trade as markets recover uh, from the price shock, from the supply or demand shock. Uh, this is an example of the inventory of a major U.S. broker-dealer. Uh, that um, does block market making and equities. This particular um, illustration that you're looking at is the inventory of this major broker dealer, um, which kindly provided its data to me in Apple Inc., um, which is, as you know, the largest cap U.S. equity at this point. And the, as you can see from this plot of its inventory over over time, but um, a bit more than a year. Um, there are sudden, indeed sudden, unexpected increases or reductions in inventory associated with um, this market-making activity. Uh, uh, this next slide, which is called a QQ plot, um, illustrates the degree to which the shocks to that market maker's inventory have fat tails. Um, Thin-tailed um, shocks would stay within the dotted lines indicating normality. Uh, but here we're seeing that the major increases, unexpected increases and unexpected um, reductions in inventory of this market maker are not normal. They have very fat tails um, in light of the uh, big blocks of stock that they're asked to buy and sell. Here is um, the same broker-dealer's inventory in a particular investment grade corporate bond. The distinguishing feature here is that these large unexpected uh, changes in inventory are based on much less frequent trade. U.S. corporate bonds are traded much less frequently than equities, and they're not uh, uh, corporate bonds are not traded on an exchange, which means that there are a uh, few other sources of uh, immediacy or liquidity to buyers and sellers than uh, the broker dealers themselves. So this Venn diagram, which I'm going to take you through in some detail, is meant to illustrate what I view as the key tension in applying um, the Volcker rule. This is the key difficulty that the agencies face in restricting a prop trading that's not market making. So the, um, the diagram is meant to illustrate the notion that there's a universe of prop trading within which is market making and, and um, other prop trading that's not designed to make markets. Like other prop trading, market making is designed to buy low and sell high. Uh, in writing the statute, Congress decided that it's a form of prop trading that should be exempted. I'm not going to question that. 
um, today, and we're just going to talk about the difficulty of implementing that. A certain amount of market making is demonstrably uh, so. That is, um, one can see based on the metrics that have been proposed um, by the agencies in their rule proposal document um, that certain trading patterns are consistent with um, um, a desire to uh, intent to meet uh, demands for immediacy by clients. Um, those kinds of trades are profiting mainly from bid-ask spreads. They tend not to have sudden unexpected changes in risk, and um, they tend to be significantly customer-facing as opposed to being associated with positions that are laid off with other uh, market makers or dealers. Um, that demonstrably market-making uh, set of trades sits within a broader set of market-making activities, um, which are in principle also exempted in the Volcker Rule statute, but which would be much more difficult to detect when a dealer, for example, takes a very large block um, unexpectedly that causes its inventory to rise and, a, and, uh, and increase its risk, and when it profits from doing so, um, that those sorts of trades may be um, difficult uh, to set aside as market making because they may appear to be as easily associated with prop trading that has no market making intent. And uh, measuring the intent of um, a firm or a trader uh, in those kinds of trades is going to be very difficult for the agencies to do. Likewise, there are very uh, clearly de um, defined uh, speculatively uh, uh, motivated trades that are not associated with market making uh, that can be identified and separated. And some of, some of that separation has already occurred simply from the fact that some of the banks have decided to eliminate some of their prop trading desks or reduce their positions in hedge funds. The middle ground is going to be very difficult to, separ to separate. Uh, um, there's going to be uh, both type 1 and type 2 errors, that is false positives and false negatives, um, when one tries to separate trades that are intended uh, to be market making from those that are not intended to be market making. And that's going to be one of the um, the main concerns that's going to drive this, uh, some difficulties for the uh, agencies in implementing this rule. So um, the, the, the questions that I want to focus on today are um, what specific aspects of the proposed um, implementation of the Volcker rule could in fact discourage market making by banks. Then I'm going to talk about if market making does migrate because of the proposed implementation of the Volcker Rule, where might it go? What other types of firms might pick that up? And then um, what eventually could cause, what could cause uh, market making to be viewed in as to be in violation of the proposed rules? So to, uh, by the way, some of these questions were asked to me uh, um, for purposes of, pre of a presentation I made last week to the SEC, um, the FDIC, uh, the CFTC, the Fed, the Treasury, the, and the OCC um, in a meeting I had with them last Wednesday. And I must say that, that they're quite interested in understanding the concerns that have been raised about their proposed implementation and in, and in understanding um, exactly why in my report I suggest that um, the proposed implementation may in fact reduce liquidity in markets and cause market making to migrate. So, so why do I feel that way? Well, the proposed implementation document uh, has language, some of which I'll get into, which suggests that market making should not make uh, profits for dealers other than through uh, normal fees, commissions, and, and bid-ask spreads. It should not profit substantially from price appreciation, uh, which would also uh, be consistent. Uh, that is, price appreciation would also be consistent with uh, prop trading that's not market making, so an issue will arise as to how much uh, trading should be allowed if it generates significant price appreciation. The document suggests that that's the intention is to try to limit that kind of um, market making or that kind of prop trading. The second uh, concern is that uh, the document reads in a manner that suggests that when implementing the Volcker Rule, the agencies will not look favorably upon prop trading um, that involves risks that rise suddenly or dramatically or unpredictably. 
um, because they're the proposed metrics uh, that pick those um, changes in risk up would then suggest to the agencies uh, that perhaps this is not market making trading. And then finally, there's a suggestion in the document that market making trades are normally customer facing, although there is some allowance in the proposed in the um, proposed rules for some degree of trading that's not uh, customer facing. So here's uh, an example of some passages quoted from the proposal document that that uh, raise these that raise these concerns. So one uh, in, at one point in the document, the agencies say, and I quote: "Market making and related activities seek to generate profitability primarily by generating fees, commission spreads, and other forms of customer revenue that are relatively, though not completely, insensitive to market fluctuations, and generally result in a high level of revenue." relative to risk over an appropriate time frame. While it's certainly true that some market making trading would meet this definition, there are, I think it's clearly the case that there are other forms of market making that are designed to provide immediacy to clients that would not involve fees primarily, uh, profits primarily associated with fees, commissions, and spreads, but, but would require as an incentive to the market maker uh, a substantial amount of profit associated with price appreciation. Another, at another point in the proposal document, the agencies write that uh, significant, significant, abrupt, or inconsistent changes to key risk management measures such as VAR that are inconsistent with prior experience, the experience of similar situated trading units and management's stated expectations for such measures may indicate impermissible proprietary trading. Again, I feel that um, there are um, legitimate uh, market making uh, trading activities that do involve significant abrupt or inconsistent changes to key risk management measures uh, simply because some demanders of immediacy uh, will often want to un unload or take on very large uh, positions that bank market makers um, often do provide as part of their market making services. Uh, I hope at this point um, the question of type 1 versus type 2 errors is starting to come forward in your mind as, a, as the primary concern that one has in enforcing the, um, the Volcker Rule statute. Uh, Congress has given the agencies a, a very tough job because they've asked the agencies to rule out trading that is not intended to make markets and to exempt uh, market making trading and the middle ground is going to be difficult uh, to separate into those two uh, categories. Uh, for example, uh, you know, just using for illustration the trades that I showed you a moment ago, uh, when a market maker buys um, a large block, it tends to buy it at a price concession from the seller and uh, that then lays it off over time at an increasing um, uh, range of prices and then when the market maker sells a large block, it tends to sell it at a price concession in the opposite direction and then lay off its uh, imbalance in inventory over time at improving prices for the market maker. And so this, this pattern of trading, providing immediacy uh, to client investors um, would, uh, if the blocks are large, generate large unpredictable changes in risk and would uh, generate a substantial amount of the amount of the profit associated with price appreciation as opposed to fees, commissions, and bid-ask spreads. Um, this is uh, an example. This is the average path of prices following the deletion of an equity from the S&P 500 index over the period 1990 to 2002. Um, this particular trading pattern may not be, uh, or price pattern may not be on the case today, but it certainly illustrates the fact that when there are substantial blocks of equities that must be sold on very short notice, um, market makers stand to uh, participate in providing liquidity to those block sellers and stand, and stand to profit substantially from price appreciation after um, they purchase those blocks. Uh, they lay it off over time at substantially higher prices eventually. Um, this is a risky trade. The screen shows the average path over about 65 such deletion, deletions, but on any individual deletion, uh, one can only um, provide immediacy um, in this manner by taking on a substantial amount of risk. 
Um, this this sort of trading behavior by a, a bank or a bank affiliate um, would run afoul of the proposed uh, rule document um, on the grounds that I've mentioned earlier, and that it would substantially profit from price appreciation and would involve large um, increases in risk. How will the agencies implement their uh, approach to what constitutes valid market making? Well, they have a list of 17 metrics, which I'll mention in a moment, which will be used, quote, to determine whether these activities involve propri prohibited proprietary trading because the trading activity either is inconsistent with permitted market making related activities or presents a material exposure to high-risk assets or high-risk trading strategies. So in other words, um, these metrics will be used to attempt to separate uh, trading behavior and to accept it and unacceptable trading behavior based on the philosophy that I quoted um, earlier. The agencies have not set um, tripwires for noncompliance. Um, so their framework is still uh, not a rigid one. They have flexibility when applying it, and uh, that's to the credit of the agencies that they haven't tried to um, design a, uh, a very rigid uh, compliance framework. Uh, but when banks implement um, the uh, Volcker rule, uh, they will uh, presumably have an internal compliance regime that will involve um, uh, measuring these metrics and then setting up internal uh, compliance guidelines and uh, reporting both internally and to agencies uh, concerning their compliance. And um, when they do so, they will also have to make um, some judgment um, regarding type 1 and type 2 errors, that is false positives and false negatives, and that will leave banks in, uh, with some concern about regulatory forbearance uh, regarding uh, what the banks believe to be market making, but what the uh, regulatory agencies uh, uh, may disagree with. The agencies have asked for comments on this approach. Here's a list, um, courtesy of Deloitte, from a presentation by Kim Olson that I attended last week uh, that just basically lists the five categories of metrics and what their purposes are. For example, risk management measurements would, the first group, the block A, would be used um, in part to measure uh, risk levels and changes in risk. Source of revenue measurements would be used in part to determine whether the trading behavior is primarily associated with normal uh, fees, commissions, bid-ask spreads, or alternatively is coming substantially from price appreciation in the market. Uh, then the, uh, similarly, revenue relative to risk measures, judging whether the um, trading behavior is risky relative to its revenue, how much then in block D of the trading behavior is customer facing versus not. Um, as well as uh, inventory uh, measurement, and then finally pay to receive a measure of how much um, the uh, trading activity at the bank or bank affiliate is associated with um, profiting from spreads as opposed to paying spreads to others. So here is um, a question uh, for those participating. I would be very curious to get your impression, which need not be the same as mine, um, regarding whether, in fact, um, the proposed Volcker rule would reduce market liquidity during the first, say, two years after its implementation. And the three answers, um, one of which you should select, and I'll be interested in your, in your answer, is uh, one, none too relatively little, uh, two, moderately, or three, significantly. Okay, everyone, I'm ahead and send this question out to the audience, and we'll give you a few moments to mark your answers. Okay, I have about 75% of the audience who's voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and announce the results. And Dr. Duffy, on this question, we had 32% of the audience selecting one, none to relatively little, 37% selecting number two, moderately, and 32% selecting number three, significantly. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. There's a wide range of views. I'm going to move on. Uh, to the next range of concerns that I have. If you recall, my first concern was that market uh, making restrictions would um, uh, cause um, a reduction in market liquidity. The second uh, concern is that uh, firms, banks that are currently um, offering market making services, possibly through their affiliates, might, given the reduced incentive to make markets and the reduced profitability associated with it, might um, stop making markets or, or to some extent stop making markets. 
and uh, who will pick that up? I do think markets will become more liquid again over time. Uh, one possibility is that market making services would be provided by firms that are currently banks but would choose to give up their banking charters um, in order to uh, support their current business models. Um, there, are, there are obvious examples of, of firms in that, of banks in that category. The, some have suggested that foreign banks may pick up um, some of this market making activity, um, although there is a restriction on the extent to which U.S. investors could be able to access foreign banks uh, for market making services. So another possibility is that some U.S. investment activity may also move offshore. A third possibility is that uh, some banks that uh, have uh, a broker dealer or other market making affiliates may choose to spin those off so that they're not within the bank holding company and therefore would be less restricted in offering market making services. Current non-bank um, affiliated market makers uh, could um, provide some of the missing market making services. Hedge funds, as has been suggested, could begin to become effective or actual market makers. The uh, Volcker rule, the, the proposed rules will not um, affect very much the behavior of insurance firms, uh, which could then become more active in their investment activity and to some extent provide liquidity. Um, asset managers could uh, provide effective market making activities to some extent acting as agents for their asset management clients. There are, there are other possibilities. Some of these may actually improve uh, the quality of our markets um, reduce any distortions that are caused by uh, concentration, high, high degrees of concentration among uh, bank market makers. For example, currently OTC derivatives are almost entire, almost the entire um, uh, market for OTC derivatives is made by a small number of, of U.S. banks. Some, so some provision of market making activity outside of the regulated bank environment could uh, work out rather well in some respects. My concern, however, is that uh, once uh, significant um, market makers outside of the banking system are set up and um, uh, constitute uh, systemically important firms, the uh, financial stability may, um, may be harmed. It's possible uh, that these firms will not be uh, subjected to the same degree of supervisory oversight, the same uh, capital or liquidity requirements that are required of uh, banks and bank affiliates, and that they will not have the degree of access to lender of last resort provided by central banks um, that are available to some extent through, uh, through banks. So my second uh, question for you is how much would the proposed Volcker rule eventually cause market making to migrate away from banks or bank affiliates? And again, the three answers are none to relatively little, moderately, or significantly. And again, I'll be very curious about your views on this. Okay, I'm going to send this question out. And again, we'll give you a few moments to mark your answers. Okay, I think I have all the votes in that I'm going to get at this point. So I'm going to close the poll and announce the results. And Dr. Duffy, on this question, we had 13% of the audience selecting answer number one, 41% selecting answer number two, and 47% selecting answer number three. Thank you, Christine. And here's the last uh, question um, uh, that I'd love to get your views on, uh, which is, what would the emergence of large non-bank market makers imply for systemic risk? And the answer, the potential answers are systemic risk would be lowered. Second one, systemic risk would be about the same. And the third one, systemic risk would be higher. Okay, I'm going to launch this question now. All right, it looks like we have all the votes in. I'm going to close the poll and announce the results. And on this question, we had 22% of the audience selecting answer number one, 27% selecting answer number two, and 51% uh, answering number three. Well, thank you again, Christine. 
Um, another question that I um, was asked by the regulators in Washington last week to address is what could cause potential unexpected large spikes in inventory of a market maker? And um, one of the um, possibilities is issuances of securities. Uh, now, of course, issuances are primarily handled by underwriters, but then there's a significant amount of liquidity provision by market makers as well, and some of that would be uh, causing, in my view, significant spikes in inventory by market makers. The second possibility is the example I gave you earlier of an index recomposition where a stock is taken into or dropped from a major index, uh, which would cause um, the very large amount of index um, investors, uh, that is uh, those operating index funds or ETFs, to um, accumulate large uh, positions or get rid of large positions in those equities. A third example we saw a couple of weeks ago uh, when a six billion dollar plus block of made lane assets was quickly sold um, by the Fed in an auction um, and the, the last block was picked up by by Goldman Sachs. There had been several other, uh, two other blocks earlier than that that had been sold off. So when a large uh, government um, a block of assets is sold or government assets are privatized, there is sometimes an opportunity for a market maker to provide immediacy in those sales, uh, suddenly increasing its risk and hopefully uh, having the incentive to do so uh, from the profit opportunity associated with that. Another example would be large purchases or sales by corporations or high net worth individuals, foreign sovereigns, and so on. Uh, pardon me, including central banks uh, and, uh, or other investors of derivatives uh, or commodities. Another example would be not a large uh, buyer or seller, but rather a correlated synchronous demand for immediacy uh, by many investors. And then finally, something unpredictable. Uh, here's an example of the uh, average price impact over 3,850 U.S. secondary offerings on the price of an equity um, relative to uh, the secondary market price on the day of the offering. And as you can see, there is a substantial amount of, of, of adjustment of inventory reflected in the price going into and coming out of uh, that offering. Um, this kind of trading involves significant changes in risk and, of course, pr price appreciation as an incentive to do that. Uh, for those providing liquidity, some of whom would be underwriters, but also would be market makers. Um, here is an example of, of the price impact, uh, even in a market as liquid as the U.S. Treasuries associated with auctions. What you're looking at is the yield of on the runs on the top row and then off the runs in the bottom row relative to those at the issuance. And you can see um, that yields uh, increase coming into the issuance and then decrease coming out. Now, U.S. Treasuries, among, among a few other uh, classes of assets, such as currencies, general obligation, municipals, repos, um, FX forwards and swaps, and a few other things have been exempted. Um, but uh, there would be an effect on any, any assets that are not exempted, and presumably the effect will be larger than that for U.S. Treasuries because U.S. Treasuries are among the most liquid securities. As some of you know, foreign governments have asked that their uh, government securities also be exempted. This is an example of a more extreme effect associated with an issuance of a corporate bond. Here, just to show that it's not only an underwriting effect, um, the, the chart is restricted to corporate bonds, not of the issuer, but of other issuers in that sector, which is the European telecom sector. This is from work by Egal Newman and Michael Ryerson. Uh, the yields, again, run up into the issuance date and then, on average, uh, run back down again as providers of immediacy initially clear space on their balance sheets to absorb this issuance and then lay off the positions they take at issue in the secondary market at higher and higher prices. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the next section of material, which describes how the interdealer network uh, uh, lays off risk uh, that it, uh, from its market-making activities with each other. Um, uh, this issue uh, comes up in the uh, Volcker Rule proposal document with respect to concerns in implementing um, the Volcker Rule by agencies whenever 
a substantial fraction of trading uh, by a bank or bank affiliate is not customer facing but is dealer facing. Uh, again, I'm going to skip that. Um, the main uh, concern that I have in in uh, banks doing market making risk is that they're safe and sound, consistent with the intent in the Volcker rule that market making risk should not increase the failure risk of a bank. And I proposed in my submission to the agencies that they consider using the statutory language when judging the cost and benefit of type 1 and type 2 errors, uh, they consider the use of uh, capital and liquidity requirements in, in that cost-benefit trade-off. The statutory language still requires the agencies to uh, attempt to separate permissible from non-permissible prop trading, uh, the permissible including market making and underwriting. Um, but when in that gray area where the intent of a trader or the metrics available do not make it clear whether the trade is uh, required to be exempted by statute or required uh, to be ruled out by statute. In making those judgments, the use of capital and liquidity requirements can assist in the cost benefit um, of making those type 1 and type 2 errors because it can, it, uh, capital and liquidity requirements uh, can be used to protect the bank from failure risk. Right now, we don't have a final Basel III uh, capital and liquidity requirement for trading risks. Uh, we have a current temporary standard called Basel 2.5 informally. Uh, the Basel Committee on Banking, Banking Supervision is about to uh, publish a study of their uh, views on appropriate um, uh, capital and liquidity requirements for uh, proprietary trading or for trading risks, and I think um, the agencies uh, might benefit from using that study in in um, in part of their uh, in determining their final rules uh, for implementing the Volcker uh, rule statute. My biggest concerns, of course, are that capital and liquidity be very substantially um, available and able to handle tail risk, particularly associated with liquidity, which is important in the market making environment. I'm going to skip over the next slide in the interest of time. In fact, I think I'm going to open it up for questions at this point so that everyone has a chance to, uh, to participate in this webinar. And, and I, uh, I do appreciate already um, the answers that you provided to the three questions. So Christine, would you mind opening it up for questions? Absolutely. The audience can send their questions using the question pane. Dr. Duffy, we do have one question that's waiting for you at this point, so hopefully you can see that in your question panel there. Okay, so I'll repeat that question. Okay, so this is a question from Anthony Gagno, and the question is, what lessons, if any, can we draw from the European bank's weaknesses created by their significant country debt instruments uh, such as bonds, trading, and how can we balance risks and rewards in a responsible way? Okay, so I, I believe Mr. Gagno is referring to the fact that um, a number of large Eurozone banks have invested substantially in Eurozone uh, government bonds. Uh, one could consider those investments, especially these days during a Eurozone debt crisis, as um, involving a significant amount of trading risk, uh, depending on, on um, uh, um, well, a number of factors, um, the credit quality of the bonds, the ability of the bank to um, withstand uh, losses and so on. So how do we balance uh, risks and rewards in a responsible way in this respect? I think most importantly, as I've mentioned, is the capital and liquidity requirements. A risk is too large when it's large relative to the bank to absorb losses associated with that risk. So that um, we don't need to, in my view, severely restrict um, banks from taking on these risks if they're providing liquidity. Uh, what we need to do is to make sure that they have substantial amounts of capital and liquidity to withstand losses associated with those. I'm going to open up another question from David Rowe. And David asks, to what extent do you feel this issue is magnified by a lack of both public and political understanding of the purpose and value of markets and the role of market makers? Uh, it's a tough question. Uh, we know uh, that this is um, a, statu a statutory uh, impetus, so it's coming from Congress. 
Uh, we've gone through a financial crisis. There is a general, there has been a general concern among Americans and in Congress about banks taking too much risk, and um, Congress has reacted with this statute. Does Congress appreciate the value of markets and the role of market makers? I think it does. In fact, uh, Congress explicitly provided an exemption uh, for the role of market makers. I do have some concerns that um, um, in implementing the intent of Congress, the value of markets and the, role of, the important role of market makers needs to be considered um, in the cost-benefit analysis of that. And uh, we don't have a final rule yet and there is an opportunity for the agencies um, in coming up with their final rule and in implementing it to, uh, to, to make those trade-offs. And uh, the people that I met um, last week in Washington seemed very intent on um, making a, a, a good, good judgment in that. I, I fully respect the fact that they, they feel bound to um, follow the intent of Congress and, and to, um, to do as, good, as well as they possibly can. And, and making those cost-benefit trade-offs. What they're actually going to do, I, I can't say at this point. And uh, let me let me say hello to David Rowe. He's a, um, a good uh, friend and professional colleague for many years. Okay, so the next question is from Jefferson Braswell. His question is, how is distinguishing the intent or purpose of one proprietary trade over another, that is, vis-a-vis uh, -vis market making or not, how is that possible? So as I mentioned earlier with my Venn diagram illustration, in some cases it will be relatively straightforward. There will be a pattern of requests for immediacy by market makers that's well identified statistically. And there will be a pattern of profitability that's mainly from bid-ask spread or fees or commissions. Those kinds of trades will be relatively easy to distinguish. The type 1 versus type 2 error problem doesn't arise there. It will be, it will be very, very much more difficult in my view um, to make that distinction um, when trades are much less frequent, much larger and unexpected in size, and involve substantially um, greater factor of price appreciation in the incentive of a market maker to provide those trades, those trades will, will be almost indistinguishable from those that a bank or bank affiliate might take without any intent to provide market making services. So I think um, it's, the, it's that middle ground um, which is going to be very difficult for the agencies, and this is not something this is not a task that they chose to take on on their own. It's Congress that has asked them to attempt to make those distinctions. And as I said, they're going to have to use their judgment and, and a, and a cost-benefit analysis in making those distinctions. I now see another question from Terry Wright, who asks, um, uh, why use the Volcker Rule and not just go back to keeping banks out of equity writing a la Glass-Steagall? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, that's an alternative point of view. That it, uh, it it was the law of the land until around the 1990s. Um, I think it was considered. I mean, my understanding is it was considered too big of a change in the structure of financial markets um, for Congress to take on in one gulp. And uh, what they decided instead to do is to allow banks to continue to make markets, uh, but to attempt to reduce. Um, risk-taking uh, through trading in other forms. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't give a very uh, coherent answer to that because it's not, a, it's not an easy question to answer at all. Here's another question uh, from another old friend, uh, Geraldo Fulgerius, who asks, capital and liquidity levels, any suggestions in the face of a cost-benefit analysis of immediacy and systemic risk? Well, I'm not going to make quantitative suggestions here, um, but um, I will point to the, this Basel Commission of Banking Supervision, uh, which is coming up with a document which I believe will be um, likely to be a very helpful document um, in uh, making quantitative judgments. Um, of course, these are always imperfect. And I would put a particular emphasis on liquidity. Um, market making is distinct from many other forms of bank risk taking in that um, it places often very high demands on liquidity through margin, um, collateral effects, marks to market, um, ca cash flows of various kinds. Providing immediacy to clients often involves offering trades which will drain cash out of the market maker very quickly, especially if, if a bank's uh, liquidity is of concern, there could even be a run. Um, and uh, that's um, played a significant role in our last financial crisis.
Uh, so when when uh, focusing on market making capital and liquidity, I would put special emphasis on the liquidity side of that. It should not be the capital should not be simply some uh, very simple multiple of assets um, because different kinds of risks present different kinds of difficulties uh, for a bank, and I think uh, particularly in the area of derivatives, uh, one needs to be very cautious. Um, the effects of clearing versus not cleared, how much collateral to uh, would be required, um, what is the safety and soundness of the clearing, the central clearing party itself. Um, in the area of repo, uh, which is an exempted activity, um, capital and liquidity is also very important, judging the, uh, based on in part on the maturity of the debt that's rolling over. And prime brokerage, as we know, during the financial crisis, turned out to be a liquidity drain for certain very large broker dealers, um, unexpectedly large and uh, very difficult to measure uh, based on standard capital and liquidity uh, regulations or approaches. I'm going to move on to the question from uh, William, and I believe the name is Flayful. And he asks, in your example of Goldman buying collateral, it's easy to make bids for large blocks of securities in 2012. Where was Goldman in 2008 when the Fed was the only buyer? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. And I think um, I'm not, for, not referring specifically to Goldman, but this is one of the reasons that we want banks and their broker-dealer affiliates to be very highly capitalized so that when a financial crisis does come along, um, financial firms can continue to provide robust uh, market-making liquidity um, services to the rest of the market. One of the slides that I skipped over showed a tremendous increase in the CDS basis, that is the difference between bond yields and the bond yields that are implied by CDS uh, opened up to almost unheard of levels, um, 250 basis points for example in the investment grade arena and not just for, for moments at a time, for weeks at a time. So that, that loss of market making capacity during the financial crisis, which is the premise of this question, I believe, um, is a very serious concern and can only be addressed, in my view, um, by requiring very high capital and liquidity requirements. I understand that um, uh, my, proposed, my proposal is being viewed as, um, in, in some press accounts I just read, as being uh, somehow entirely from the viewpoint of banks who are um, concerned about uh, implementation of the local rule. Uh, but banks have also uh, been concerned about the imposition of high capital and liquidity requirements. And uh, on, on that particular issue, I'm not sure my proposal will be all that well received in a, a, um, among those banks that have suggested that very high capital and liquidity requirements are probably uh, are not necessary. I believe they are, they are necessary. Now there's a question from uh, Anthony Gagno again who asks, is it only a capital and liquidity issue? Market confidence in banks is hurt even if capital is depleted. I'm not really sure I understand um, the question, so I might ask um, Mr. Gagno if he, if he could rephrase it, maybe with a hypothetical that would help me understand the, the scenario that he has in mind associated with um, the confidence in banks. If it's not from concerns about capital and liquidity, um, where, where, where might those concerns be placed? So maybe an example would help. Here's a question from Killian Heitzman, uh, who asks, would you agree with the latest article in The Economist uh, titled Overregulated America, which states that we need a much smarter approach to regulation, that is simpler rules, strict analysis of cost benefit, accountability of regulators, because one, lawmakers seem to believe that they can lay down rules to govern um, every eventuality, and two, lobbying that makes laws very complex and error prone. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to um, suggest that lawmakers necessarily believe they can lay down rules to govern every eventuality, or that lobbying is responsible for the problems that we're seeing. Um, but I would definitely agree with the premise of the Economist art article, which is that we need uh, to take a much smarter approach to regulation, um, simpler rules, but obviously intelligent rules that are designed uh, to meet um, the objectives of an efficient uh, safe and sound financial system, and that the use of cost-benefit analysis is crucial in doing that, and that uh, regulators and, and everyone, in fact, should be accountable uh, to the extent that um, uh, they provide um, for good 
uh, supervision and that um, providers of financial services, of course, are also accountable. So I, I, def I definitely agree with the, uh, with the overall thrust of the Economist article. And by the way, I'm not, um, there are, one could go to the Dodd-Frank Act, for example, which is a very long, complex piece of legislation. Um, I'm not, um, I'm, I don't think one should simply treat this as a take it or leave it in terms of uh, criticism. It's got some good things and it's got some not so good things in it. And I think we just need to continue to work at regulation uh, over the next years to try to get it as, um, as close to the, um, the ideal that's suggested in the Economist article as we can. I don't see any more questions and I think we're almost out of time. Is that correct, Christine? That is correct. So at this time, Dr. Duffy, we'd like to thank you for sharing your expertise today and I'd like to thank the audience for joining us. I'd also like to mention that Premia is having a global risk conference which will take place in New York from May 14th through the 16th this year, 2012. And if you'd like to find out more about attending, please go to www.premia.org. And thank you all for attending this Premia webinar. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, everyone.